Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is currently Sunday, January 22nd, 2012, and this is Day 9 Daily number 403, where we learn to be a better gamer. Today, we're going to be examining all things Phoenixes in PvP, using Grubby as our examination man. Yeah. Before we go into that, I want to describe uh, a little bit of reality-defying news. My encoder says that there is no stream going out right now. But people can still see me. Ha <laughs> ha! Owning! Crushing my technology. Mmm, take that. Before we step into today's game, um, or today's topic of Phoenixes, I want to talk a little bit about the way you feel when you try something new. In particular, the way you feel when you lose. Because I'm envisioning that there's going to be a lot of people who are going to try out this Phoenix strategy we talk about today. It's going to go horrifically, and you're going to get all those usual negative balls of emotion that happen. Like the whole, ugh, I suck, oh god, you know, your face gets hot and your heart's all pounding and you feel a little shaky in the hands. You're like, god, I'm so stupid, ugh. And you want to you wanna do things like cuss out your opponent, which don't do, by the way. You know, you want to rage and then um, six pool in your next game. <laughs> you switch to Zerg, you six pool your next opponent because you want to show him all that jazz. And a lot of that stems from thinking of your strategies as an extension of you. It's not a strategy that you're doing. It's my strategy that I did. If you went for Phoenix... There's so many people who will lose what the Phoenix is and say, God, I suck, instead of saying, wow, that Phoenix strategy sucks. And here's the mental shift I want you to make because few things are more upsetting than when you get really, really angry after losing regularly or just feel like crap after losing regularly because then you don't get to experience the joy that is experimenting and fiddling around with new strategies, exactly what we're going to do today. I want you to think about your strategies as a recipe that you're fiddling with. Where, let's suppose you're baking muffins. Mm, muffins are great. Um, I don't know how to bake, by the way. I just go to Starbucks and buy their muffins. And you sprinkle, you know, some cinnamon on this recipe. Let's see how cinnamon tastes. And I'm sure as this has happened to many of you before, you try a recipe for the first time and you think, Oh my god, this recipe sucks. You're almost laughing when you're chewing the food because it tastes so bad. And you just kind of... Ugh, oh my god, and you're shifting it away. And notice how all that vocabulary is just the recipe is bad. LOL, look how terrible that is. Do that with your own strategies. Go, all right, you know what? I'm going to try to rush for Colossus after I go for Phoenixes. And then I want you to go, oh my god, is that a bad strategy? Woo-wee, am I staying away from that one? Laugh at your strategy because it's separate from you. It isn't you. And don't try to internalize it. Because if you do, you will... Feel a flash of anger every time you see a Colossus or even go to, pl to play the game Shadow of the Colossus. Anything that reminds you of it puts you on tilt. And one thing I don't want you to do is tilt hard. Sweet! With that in mind, let's talk about the amazing new school-ish strategy that is the Phoenix in Protoss vs. Protoss. Once upon a time, everyone forgated in Protoss vs. Protoss until Blizzard implemented that you could not warp in onto a ramp. In, um, for Protoss. So what this means is that suddenly, as we look at one of these bad boys, we don't have to worry about something where a pylon is here and zealots get warped in right here at the front of the ramp, thereby breaking our opponent for an easy win. We don't have to worry about that at all. If we're grubby, if we're grubby up here, we can easily throw down one force field and any huge amount of units stays down there at the bottom and we're safe. Seems like a pretty simple adjustment, helps open up some new strategies. And suddenly the Phoenix, which was, which was widely considered one of the worst ways to open, is suddenly now one of the best ways to open. One of the basic logics of the Phoenix is that in this matchup, it's very, very hard to get up an expansion with any speed at all. Um, so we're generally going to be one base versus one base. There's generally going to be some cutting of probes. If we open Phoenix, in many circumstances, we can almost always kill off a probe or two or three, thereby getting us a little bit ahead. And even though three probes doesn't sound like that much, when it's your 25 probes to his 22, that's a substantial probe lead at that point in time, just because you're so early on in the game. Now, what I'm going to begin talking about is we start off with this one introductory game by none other than Grubby himself, 
is we're going to talk about the fact that Grubby is awesome. He uh, donated me this replay. He actually donated me a bazillion replays. We're going to be looking at just him today. Uh, I, right now, he's actually currently playing a show match against Liquid Chef. So you can tune into that on twitch.tv slash follow Grubby. And of course, you can find him on all things related to follow Grubby, which you should do because he kicks ass. As we begin this game, we see the usual gateway on 12. It's very typical timing, nothing out of the ordinary at this point. But we immediately need to ask ourselves the most basic question of all, which is, if we're going to build phoenixes at some point, how do we get there? In all the games we're going to look at today, which I'm thinking is going to be four, I'm going to have to be a little bit speedy on the time here, it's going to be about four games that we're going to blast through. We're always going to be talking about how does he get to the phoenixes without dying? Because even though four gates are weaker, they still can kill us. <laughs> because there's still some people who do it. Crap! One big announcement I wanted to make. After Hours Gaming League, oh, it's going to be live right after the show. We're kicking off week one with Electronic Arts versus the reigning champion Microsoft live. Live right now after the show around 8.15 PST-ish. Yeah. Cool. Let's come back to this game. The After Hours Gaming League. <laughs> Alright, cool. So the Assimilator gets thrown down right now. And Grubby's doing just little things. Notice how he builds this one pylon and he just zhoop, pulls back. Notice how his probe scout just checked this little fringe area and checked down here for proxy gate and just zhoop, moved out over there. This probe ended up popping down pretty late, a little while, uh, around the time that the Assimilator got constructed. And this is where it's important to know useful times. If you start a stalker, a stalker um, will generally finish at 4 minutes and 15 seconds if it has not been chrono boosted. So this probe literally, even though it's scouting seemingly late, um, or I guess I'd say later than what you'd see in the other matchups, this is still a fine time to scout. And it's important that you kind of identify um, when you need to be scouting. I mean, look, the Zealot's even halfway done right now, and we are having complete information. Back in Grubby's base, Grubby is doing a very old-school maneuver, which is to build this second gas geyser right as he can afford it. He builds his cybernetics core, and then his immediate next set of cash goes to the assimilator. For the longest amount of time, you are building the Zealot. Um, but this is increasingly coming back into popularity. Um, way, way, way old-school long ago, like in the beta, this was the way to open. No, nothing too crazy about this. Um, but the four gate kind of absolutely slaughtered everything other than doing a four gate. But nowadays this comes right on back and we're going to happily use this gas in a lot of creative ways. Now immediately we still need to ask ourselves how do we deal with a four gate? There's every possibility that real still could do some sort of aggressive action. He's gassed late, which players will still do. He is chrono boosting his warp gate and he still has a lot of energy. But we're going to see um, Grubby do some interesting things. Look at this. Chrono boosting out on the Stalker seems pretty reasonable. I mean, just getting a first Stalker out. We can kill off our opponent's probes. We can then, uh, once his probe's gone, then we can build the Stargate. But Grubby, interestingly, is actually chrono boosting twice on, this, uh, on his first gateway, which I love. If we're envisioning all the ways that we can stop a four gate, well, if he's doing something like a 1-gate into 4-gate, the biggest problem that we're going to have is his probe getting nearby our base and building a pylon. So what we're going to do is we're just going to chrono boost out a ton of stalkers. A huge number of stalkers. Look at that. Three chrono boosts already been thrown down. And suddenly, in these little small, tiny micro-engagements, look at how aggressively Grubby is poking into this. Sure, there is a probe over here. This is actually one of the most devastating things in the whole world, to have a probe in your base at this point in time. So the fact that Grubby is actually rattling back here is so critical, because if this probe just goes like pylon, 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 you can be in some pretty scary situations. But even so, Grubby ends up being quite comfortable and can push his opponent way back with these three chrono-boosted stalkers. He can push his opponent way, way back to his own ramp. So, already we've asked ourselves how do we get to this Stargate in the first place? The answer is we are always doing things that give us a lot of units out in middle early on. 
in almost every game that we're going to look at today, that's a very big theme. Grubby also does this when he goes Robo, a lot of times when he just goes Twilight Council. Basically, any time that Grubby is doing something slightly tech-leaning, he's just drilling Chrono Boost all onto units in the middle of the field, as opposed to spending a ton of Chrono Boost on this Warp Gate. Because, again, Grubby is not trying to get a lot of units to kill you off early. He's trying to get enough to push you back, and then this is the... Er, uh, excuse me. This Stargate unit is what he wants. And, of course, spending <laughs> one or two Chrono Boosts on the Warp Gate is literally never bad in this matchup. Now, here's already some interesting transitions that we're seeing Grubby pop into. Um, at this point in time, all I've really talked about is that we haven't lost to a 4-gate. We've managed to shove a 4-gate back. I'm also going to throw into that ball um, aggressive 3-gate stalker pressure pushed back. So good. That's on the defensive footing. Um, other sorts of weird gateway aggression early styles going to give us a little trouble. But I think that another very important thing that happened that I didn't get the chance to look at as much, is it gives us a chance to put just enough pressure on our opponent to scout his front. Scouting the front, one of my favorite ideas in all the game. No sentry at all. Just gives us a good sense of what's going on here, that nothing too crazy is en route. I don't think that's as important with the Phoenix build. But here's something that's sort of odd that almost always you're going to have to do when you open Phoenixes, which is to get some set of three other buildings, like two gateways and a robo, or three gateways quickly. You just need the ability to blast out a bunch of units quickly if you can. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that his opponent is the Korean player Real, who performed very well at the Home Story Cup. Good stuff, good stuff. Now, I'll talk about what we're going to do with the Phoenixes. Where are you? We're going to talk about what we um, are going to do with the Phoenixes in just a second once he gets two here. The important thing is that Grubby is still not going to be doing too much with these gateways. Not really that much at all. You're noticing that most of the minerals are going to probes, Phoenixes, and to this robo. You essentially always need at least these three other buildings just to stay alive. And my evidence is going to be that I have access to a gigantic replay pack of Grubby. <laughs> um, even in this game, we'll see that Grubby can barely hang on, even with the success of buildings. Um, in practice, you just really need that. You can't get away with a gate. You really do desperately need three gates quickly, or two gates and a robo quickly to back stuff up. So, no big deal. But now let's talk a little bit about the possible transitions that can happen. Okay, Grubby doing some good stuff right here. Now, there's going to be a number of things that we can see. You know what? I'll even hide the production so that way we don't end up poking in here too much. The thing that the Phoenixes are really going to give us is map control, and we can scout what our opponent is doing. Um, it's not really going to be a mass Phoenix to kill him off strategy. I mean, sure, if he's doing something like going two-gate Robo Immortal... That's great. But this is where we get to talk about the big point of the Phoenixes. Already we can see things like our probe count is ahead. We generally are going to be able to non-stop probe produce without too much of an issue. Uh, we're always going to have perfect information, <laughs> unless players are going to start hiding dark trines all around the map or something like that. Um, and we can have the ability to skew ourselves hard in whatever direction, but I would say that most importantly of all, the Phoenix is not an observer. Often when you get observers in PvP, you scout them and you go, yeah, and then you really wish that you had that 75 minerals of gas back, so that way you could actually do something useful with it instead of just looking. What's cool about the Phoenix is you can actually hurt them. You can actually do a little bit of pain bringing. So Grubby, very reasonably, is just going to skirt around the edge as best he can. If we see... Uh, you know, uh, Blink Stalker plays and this sort of thing. Let's just do the intuitive. If we see a lot of Blink Stalkers, we'll just build an Immortal. Cool. If we see, um, I don't know, Colossus Tech coming up, well, great. We can continue to build Phoenixes. If a big attack is coming, well, okay, we just start cutting our Phoenix production and we can begin making a whole bunch of stuff. If our opponent is getting a little bit too over-eager with his expanding, we can always use our phoenixes to lift up the sentries and pick them off as we mount a big attack. We can almost always do these kinds of tactics, where we take our stalkers and our phoenixes and just do jump. 
Phoenixes are this really fancy, amazing tactical unit. So now we see Blink. Let's do the obvious choice. Let's go ahead and get the Immortal. But we're already noticing that the Observer Phoenix combination lets us pick off his Observers easily. There's some fairly intuitive responses that we just kind of end up doing. And I, I think the one thing that I would um, caution you on is, is actually overthinking things. You don't need to be too fancy with a lot of this opening jazz. I've seen some people always try to do these kind of weird Zealot Sentry Phoenix busts. I've seen people who um, try to overextend their... Um, or, or they sort of under-defend, sort of overextend their ability to be aggressive. Like, they'll instantly go for a Colossus right now. I mean, he's going Blade Stalkers. We're going to build Immortals. Boom! Easy peasy, Fabrizi, Parcheesi. And last but not least in this little exchange, what is another completely intuitive thing that I wanted to talk about? Well, the fact that as we back up just another few inches... Yeah! Thank you, B-Button. Um... As we saw these Stalkers begin approaching, we had just enough time to warp in another set of units. See, we first warped in our Stalker, or those Zealots, and now we can suddenly morph in three more. So we're going to morph in a Sentry, a Stalker, and we have just enough time to throw down a Force Field. You're seeing the importance of these three gateways in action right now. This is sort of like a hodgepodge force that... Maybe a little bit problematic um, if you can't produce enough of it quickly enough. And now, um, before we end up hopping into the break, I wanted to talk a little bit about this moment in gameplay right now where Grubby just takes and expand very quickly. As we just inch forward a few bits into this game, just like another 30 seconds, Grubby is going to continue to have total map control. If this were Shattered Temple, he would go by the center watchtowers. And this map, Shakur, he's going to go by those uh, bottom watchtowers every time very comfortably. And you can easily do this sort of thing. And cool. If our opponent went for an expand, which he ended up doing, look, suddenly, big probe lead, 29 to 25. Um... As we're moving across the map a lot with these sorts of phoenixes, we're just going to try to get away with as much as we can back home without making use of these gateways. That's going to be a big goal that we're going to see Grubby go for again and again and again and again, just avoiding using these. He's going to just happily build Robos, happily build Nexuses, happily build Twilight Councils and Forges and all sorts of other good stuff. He's just going to avoid building a lot of phoenixes, or excuse me, uh, a lot of gateway units and stick to a fairly small number of phoenixes. And of course, one of the most obvious and intuitive things of all, why did we stop making phoenixes? Because he went Blink Stalker. Doesn't seem to be too much a stretch of the imagination. Um, I would say that if my opponent was going for a one base Colossus type play, easy peasy. I'm just going to comfortably uh, continue to build more phoenixes or build what other, um, whatever other units I really want. Actually, Colossus is terrible against this. I, for as many reasons as you can possibly imagine. First of all, Colossi are not mobile, so the instant the Colossus and all the units leave the base, my Phoenixes swing in, kill off all your probes, and still have plenty of time to head back home and shoot your Colossus without needing any more energy. Uh, that's so cool. Um, obviously, it's going to be good in the head-on engagement with the Colossus, but... Um, one of the reasons why I bring up the Colossus at a point right now is there's a term that gets thrown around a lot called build order loss that I think can be slightly misleading. For instance, right now, if real, the opponent makes some Colossi, we're just going to kill him. It's not going to be a problem. But if... Um, Oh yeah, we're just going to kill him. It's not going to be a problem. It's going to be easy. That would not, I, I, I don't want you to think of that as a build order loss. That's more of, okay, I obviously win if he does that as a response after seeing everything I'm doing. Um, no, how, how the hell do I say that? Okay, so here's, so build order loss a lot of times can be used in tournaments to just describe in a simple sense how something works. Like, Oh, hey, that guy just went for a Nexus on 15, hasn't scouted his opponent at all, just expanded, 
And the opponent just made a whole bunch of Zerglings early on, attacked it, and won. He won with a six pool. Six pool kills that Nexus strategy by build order loss. See, both players are deciding to do something, but no one really um, got the chance to scout and that sort of thing. That's, I think, the appropriate circumstance in which you can use build order loss. Um, what I want you to do when you're thinking of this sort of Phoenix play is not to think of Colossi as that sort of build order loss. Because Real can already see everything that Grubby's doing. He can see the Phoenixes, everything's sort of clear. It's more of just a bad decision for Real to do that. So you might say, well, Sean, why are you spending so long talking about bad decisions? <laughs> for you, seems like obvious that you don't want to do that. The important idea is that with any build that you choose, you should be able to list out the stuff that would be a bad decision for him to do. In other words, the outright kills. If I go Phoenixes, I outright kill Colossus. What's a better way to say that? If he goes Colossus, I don't need to worry about it. No matter what, in all my research, as I progress forward, thinking about things in Grubby's shoes, I don't need to worry about Colossus tech from the opponent, because I already have a bunch of Phoenixes. And by doing that, you'll notice that we're limiting the box that we think about. One of the hard things, for instance, about going something like uh, a very standard three-gate robo, where we automatically build some immortals at the start. It's hard for our opponent to do a lot of bad decisions then. So we have more stuff that we need to worry about. With this Phoenix build, we crunch down a couple of things right off the bat. Cool. We're going to go to a break. And when we come back, we're going to watch Grubby's transition into the mid game. And then we're going to watch a whole lot more openings of him going Phoenix. Woo!